will be speaking to us today about compassion and slavery. You have become slaves of God. With that, I give you a further one. Thanks, Gary. I'd like to echo this morning uh, Steve's thoughts about uh, how thankful I am that I was invited to speak this year. I've enjoyed it immensely, and I, and I hope that you have gained something from the thoughts and ideas that I've expressed. So in our last class today, we're going to be talking about compassion and slavery. Uh, the verse that comes to mind is Romans chapter 6 and verse 22, you have become slaves of God. Now, slavery had always been around. It was ingrained in the practices of ancient times. It was something that was culturally accepted and had existed for centuries in the ancient world. It was just a basic feature of life. Slaves were property, and that's just the way it is. But beginning in the uh, 6th century BC, the Greeks kind of changed up a little bit. They expanded slavery by basing their entire economy on the work of slaves. So obviously you would need more slaves and, and then that would lead to a bigger economy which would need more slaves and so forth. It was kind of an endless cycle. And the Romans continued this practice in the Augustus period. It's believed that the population of Italy included 35% of that population were slaves and they played a major role in the economy and in society in general. Slaves were procured in a number of ways. They were prisoners of war. They were subjugated people from conquered nations. They were uh, the result of kidnappings. Most were born into slavery. Some people were sold into slavery. And infants that were abandoned at birth were often taken and they became slaves. Josephus reports that at the end of the Jewish War in 66 to 73 AD, that 97,000 Jews were sold into slavery. And in his campaign in Gaul, Julius Caesar, uh, it was reported that his army captured over a million people who became slaves. And what would happen is slave traders would tag along with the armies as they went into these nations so that the few soldiers and their families could be sent back to Rome to the slave market and become slaves. It's estimated that one half of the population of the city of Rome were slaves, and we're talking a million people, 500,000 slaves. The empire required the influx of 250,000 to 400,000 slaves each year to maintain that population. And we know that slaves had no rights. Even under a good master, they still had no rights. They might be given their freedom, or occasionally they might be allowed to buy their freedom. Slavery back then was different than the slavery that we think of in the 19th century in the United States. Slavery was not based on race or on ethnicity. Slaves were socially and economically inferior to free citizens, not necessarily racially. Slaves did manual labor on farms, in the mines especially, which was uh, an awful life. Many of the farms were these large estates and they were run by slaves. The mines were gold and silver, a needed mineral in the growing Roman Empire. A lot of slaves were household servants. They also were involved in commercial shipping construction, the roads that if they weren't built by the Roman army, they were built and maintained by slaves who were owned by the government. Slaves were teachers. Slaves were also such workers. In all areas of life, the government used slaves. They were city functionaries. They were kind of the national civil service of the Roman Empire, and they provided a lot of public services. The rich had hundreds of slaves, middle class individuals, merchants for example, I have two or two close slaves. Under the empire, slaves 
did enjoy more chances to lead comfortable lives than in Greek times because there was the possibility of gaining their freedom. And this was called manumission. And there was a pathway for slaves to gain their freedom. But society also allowed for the downward movement of people into slavery and also the movement out of slavery because it didn't and wasn't based on ethnicity, it was based on social class. So you could sell yourself into slavery and pay back a debt. And some slaves earned enough money to actually buy their freedom. But slavery in general was a horror. Slaves were possessions just like your dog or your cat. Owners were allowed to uh, do corporal punishment. They had the power of life and death. And virtually they could do anything to a slave. The old slave, the sixth slave, was thrown away. There was sexual exploitation of slaves and sexual abuse, assault against male and females, torture, and summary executions. And as I mentioned before, the largest percentage of slaves were born into slavery because all children of slaves were slaves. So we see slavery as immoral, we see it as an inhuman institution because of our modern sensibilities and the fact that we believe certain moral ethics about these things. But there's no evidence that the Romans seriously questioned at all slavery in the Roman society. Civic freedom and slavery were just two sides of the same coin. Either you were free or, either, or you were a slave. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. It speaks of a, a general principle here that there is neither slave nor free. And how do we see this? Is, is it something that's talking about society in general or is it talking about something in relation to our spiritual life? And what you find in looking at the evidence in the New Testament, there is none about the disciples or the first century ecclesia making it a general principle about society. None of the writers condemn slavery and none of the writers speak about changing things so slavery is overthrown. So there must be something else. It must have a spiritual impact that is being talked about. And we come back to Romans 6 and 22. You have become slaves of God. Paul says this. And what Paul is talking about is our lives and the truth. Paul takes the language and the reality that everybody sees around them, a physical slavery, you can't miss it, because it's integral to society, and he applies it to the spiritual lives of the believers. Slavery as a metaphor. Now, that's not common. There are very few ancient literature sources that use slavery as a metaphor for, for anything. So Paul is taking the usage of slavery and applying it to our lives in a way that they wouldn't understand it. Now, can you think of any other examples where the Apostle Paul takes a word and changes it in its usage to make a spiritual point? Maybe you're, you're thinking of that. Oh, we'll actually look at it in a few moments. He takes a Greek word and uses it as a metaphor while changing what that Greek word was used for in that day. Very significant and very, very unusual in Greek literature. Romans 6 and verse 18 talks about becoming enslaved to sin. But thanks be to God that through you, you were slaves to sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching you were entrusted to, and having become free from sin, you have become enslaved to righteousness. And, and, and you understand the distinction here. The, the, the verse talks about we become slaves to God, and we have become slaves to righteousness. We were slaves to sin. Now our loyalty has changed. We've, we've moved our loyalty to God rather than having our loyalty to sin. 
and it's talking about our loyalty to righteousness is how we behave. We change our acts. We change our behavior to what is morally correct. We have become slaves to God and slaves to righteousness, our beliefs and our actions. And in Romans chapters 6 and 7 and, and even 5, you, you kind of have this descriptor of king sin, especially in chapter 6. King sin or, or king death. The power of Christ destroys the power of sin. So we are born under the dominion of king sin. Under the power of sin, that was the king that ruled our lives, but now we have been transferred to Christ. The first was involuntary. We were born into it. The second is our own free will. We voluntarily place ourselves from the domain of sin into the domain of Jesus Christ. And the New Testament language about slavery is about sin. The change that's wrought in us because of our acceptance of Christ. The allegiance of the believer has now been transferred to God and that's why the New Testament says we are slaves to God. Now, the question is raised with this overarching principle and the believer's allegiance to God. Did Paul invent this concept? Where did it come from? Well, it's the language of Jesus. Jesus' ministry in which he gave parables and had discussions with his disciples teaches them that they need to be slaves to each other. Jesus tells his followers to act as slaves. Notice, not to liberate the slaves. Mark 10, 43 and 44, we must be slaves to all. He who wants to be the greatest, he who wants to lead, must become a slave to all. Jesus Christ came to serve others. And that's what, in his actions, Jesus shows to his disciples. At the Last Supper in Luke 22, he explains that leaders are ones who serve. So Jesus said to them, that the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. Not so with you, you instead, the one who wants to be greatest amongst you, must become like the youngest and a leader like the one who serves. But I am among you as one who serves. Jesus was in his life serving his disciples, and he shows us how to do it. And that contrasts with, with John chapter 8, where everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Again, that metaphor is emphasized and it comes home. Now, the metaphor is not, uh, is not new to Paul. Jesus is the greatest example himself. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, Jesus, Paul says, took the form of a servant, being obedient, and then he was crucified. So he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. So it's all about service to each other. It's all about a change inside that affects the way we live. And it seems that Jesus in his parables and in his discussions about service and about being a slave to each other is really the metaphor or the foundation that, that Paul builds on when he uses it in his discussions about slave and about deliverance from slavery or sin in Christ Jesus. That's kind of the backdrop. It was described and, 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 and showed as an example in Jesus and now Paul builds upon that and gives all of us a real physical picture of what slavery to sin is all about. And for the New Testament believers, it would be even stronger because they're living in slavery all around them. Well, what to do about the slaves who are in the Ecclesia? Wait a minute, there are slaves in the Ecclesia? Well, well of course there are. 
Where did the slaves come from? Most likely they were converted as part of the households of those who came into the truth. You have examples of many households that were converted, and I've listed out the verses for you. The whole household became converted, the family members, and that term whole household would include everyone, including the slaves. So yes, there were slaves in the New Testament. First Corinthians chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. Christians interacted with slaves as they did free men and broke bread with the slaves. So Paul ends up giving some advice. I want to just make a little digression here and, and do a little uh, exercise as I would if I was teaching. I kind of uh, thought of this at the last moment, so you have to bear with me. But I'd like to introduce to you a few people in this first century Ecclesia. The first one is Sarah. Sarah is a wealthy landowner. She has a large estate outside of Colossae, and she has 122 slaves on this estate. She has a, a very large house in Colossae, 16 members of her family, and eight slaves in your household. Her husband is an aged person. He was a former senator, a patrician, who in his dotage retired to Colossae for the good life. She has wealth, she has influence, no power, but she is well connected. And she is also an open Christian. Thank you. <coughs> Next we have Nick, who is a retired legionnaire. Nick served 20 years in the service of the Roman Empire. As a reward, he was given a plot of land outside of Colossae, and he's just gotten married because it's allowed, because he's out of the army, and he has three slaves that live with him. He was a friend of friends of a centurion who told him about Jesus Christ. Our third individual to be introduced is a businessman. This is Guy the Pastore. Guy is and has a very important function in Colossae. He is the maker of bread at Pastore. <laughs> he has a large family, which would be unusual for that day and age. And he also has seven household slaves, in addition to 11 slaves that work in his shop. And a story guy met the Apostle Paul and witnessed a miracle. Thanks, Baker. Yeah. Now, Sarah is a member of this ecclesia, and she owns a house that is extremely large in Colossae. It has an open, enclosed courtyard, and it's big enough to hold many people. So Sarah's home is where the ecclesia meets. So the service is about to begin, and the members of this ecclesia are gathering in Patricia's, Patricia, Patricia Sarah's home. Legionnaire Nick. How many slaves are you going to bring with you? Two slaves. Baker Guy, how many slaves will you bring with you? I'm bringing three. <laughs> Sarah, in your own house, how many slaves will you bring? My whole household, all eight slaves. Oh. So there you have it. That's how the slaves would be involved in the breaking of bread. In addition to these individuals and their household and their slaves, you might have a large number of plebes who are in the ecclesia. In addition to the plebes, you might have some additional patricians, maybe some Jewish converts, and even a former Pharisee. So the service commences. There's some singing, some prophecy, some prayers, 
and then the Agape Feast. And in the Agape Feast, there is the breaking of bread. Who's going to serve? Well, naturally, it would be Sarah's slaves that would do the service. Because that's what they do. They would just do it naturally. But Legionnaire Nick sees this, and he gets up to help so that the slaves don't have to do all the work. Nick's, Legionnaire Nick's slaves, they sit at the side, out of the way of everyone else. But one of Baker Guy's slaves slides up to the front and puts himself in front of one of the wealthy patricians. There are spoken rules, unspoken rules, laws that are being broken, boundaries that are being pushed in this environment because of the variety of people that are there. Slaves versus free is overlaid on other divisions. Rich over poor, men and women. Now how do the brothers and sisters learn to work together as a family in this ecclesia? It wasn't easy. So if you think you have difficulty in your church or your ecclesia, put yourself in the place of a first century ecclesia with all the difficulties that they would encounter. So that gives you a little idea of the experience, just one aspect of slavery in the ecclesia in the first century. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 and 22 says, you were a slave when called, never mind. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a slave is a freedman in the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when he was called a slave of Christ. There was no movement for manumission, no discussion of the evils of slavery, no social injustice. Uh, Paul is telling them, if you're a slave, remain a slave. He makes a discussion personal about their service to each other, not the status or the level or the position in life. Colossians chapter 3, slaves to masters. Paul says, slaves, obey your earthly masters. 1 Timothy 6, verses 1 and 2. Those who are under the yoke of, under the yoke as slaves must regard their own masters as deserving of full respect. So service and showing respect to your masters. Masters to slave, Ephesians 6 and 9. Become kind and gracious and caring. Stop threatening them that the Lord is the master of both the slave and the free. Wait a minute, that's pretty hard to do. I've been a master my whole life, and I have to treat the slave kindly, graciously, and caring, and stop threatening them. It's a big change. Masters, to do the same to them, that's your slaves, and forbear threatening, knowing that he who is both master, both their master and yours, is in heaven, and that he shows no partiality. Colossians chapter 4, Masters, treat your slaves with justice and fairness, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. It was about each other. How they treated each other, how they implemented the examples of Jesus in their lives. And this concept and this teaching that Paul is trying to demonstrate to the first century ecclesia was unheard of in that day. You just didn't compare the institution of slavery and then say you have to treat each other with respect. It was a very, very difficult message for these believers to receive because they were so ingrained in their treatment of slaves. It was a contrast to Roman culture because slaves were just held in contempt. And it was the same with the Greeks. Aristotle argued that a slave is a living tool just as a tool is an inanimate slave. Therefore, there can be no fellowship, no fellowship with a slave as a slave. But Jesus and Paul says that's not true. 
there is fellowship with one another in Christ Jesus. Will Durant, who's a famous historian, said, Christianity was not a segregated religion. Christians tried to mitigate the evils of society by the way that they lived. Now your mind is probably going to the best example in the New Testament of a slave, and that's Onesimus. Onesimus, a slave, is now a brother. Paul is sending Onesimus with Tychius back to the Ecclesia in Colossae. Onesimus is from Colossae and is being returned to Philemon. But it's going to be different on his return because now Onesimus is a brother in Christ. And it turns out that he's very, very helpful to the Apostle Paul. You, you probably know that Colossians and Philemon are kind of companion books. They, they go together on the same theme. And what Paul does is he writes this letter to his friend and his collaborator, Philemon, about this young man, now a brother, Onesimus. It is a striking effort to restore the broken relationship between a slave and a master. There were a lot of letters that are surviving today about individuals who would try to restore the relationship between two other people that were friends of theirs, but there are no surviving letters about the restoration of a slave to their master. Colossians 4 and verse 9, I sent him with Onesimus, a faithful and dear brother who is one of you. And he asks Philemon to let Onesimus stay with him. I have sent him, who is my very heart, back to you. I want to keep him, but to notice that he doesn't. I want to keep him with me so that he could serve me in your place during my imprisonment and for the sake of the gospel. He lays out what Onesimus is doing for him. And those are two very good reasons to arbitrarily keep Onesimus with him. Because I'm in prison and because it benefits the gospel. But the Apostle Paul does not try to justify his request with this big picture about how helpful Onesimus is to the preaching of the gospel and how important the work would be in the ministry. He doesn't use that as any justification to keep Onesimus. But he sends him back and he asks permission first while sending him back. Verse 14, however, without your consent, I did not want to do anything so that your good will would not be out of compulsion, but from your own willingness. Finally, in 10, 16, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother. So Paul and Philemon don't discuss the evils of, of slavery in society and that Philemon should free him because now he's in Christ. But he rather he talks about what is right, about doing the right thing rather than a justification of need. And I, I think that's an important lesson for each of us. We tend to rationalize and justify the things that we do and use the gospel as the backdrop or the, or the hammer in some of our opinions and some of our goals. And the lesson is, is that we need to do what is right. And justification to our own needs is not always the answer. Now, slaves in the Ecclesia, Christians interacted with slaves as they did with freedmen. Slaves communed, as we demonstrated in our, our little example, with owners, with freedmen. They remembered Christ together. They had fellowship with each other. They sat down at the same table, in the same ecclesia. And it was really staggering changes in personal relationships in the ecclesia. Changes between slave owners who were brothers and slaves who were brothers and sisters. And now there were brothers and sisters who 
were slaves owned by masters who were brothers and sisters. Slavery took a long time to be done away with. It was only gradually over the next 200 years that Christian slave owners started to free their slaves in increasing numbers. So you can see that even in the first and second century, it wasn't a movement of, of, of manumission, of freeing the slaves, but rather a movement of your change in relationship with each other. Most of the slaves that were freed initially were of the urban households rather than the rural. And it wasn't only until two or three hundred years later that slavery was actually abolished and, uh, and, and there were laws passed that uh, rescinded the laws that prevented uh, uh, Romans from freeing their slaves. And then, and then finally it wasn't even until the seventh century that the slaves were given their freedom but they became serfs so that freedom was basically uh, pretty limited. So then moving on from this culture of slavery, we'll look at something that ties in somewhat, and that is the idea of compassion and charity, and the development of a support system within the Ecclesia to show compassion to others. Now Christians in the first century would be familiar with the parables of Jesus and the spiritual principles that Jesus taught. Uh, Matthew 25, uh, I was uh, uh, did, I, I was hungry and you gave me food and I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. They would understand that principle. They would, would know about that parable and that story about those who were sick and in prison and, and that, that you came and, 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 and helped these individuals. So they would know what was required. Luke 10 and verse 30 talks about the parable of the Samaritan. And you look at the language that's used in the parable of the Good Samaritan. He felt compassion. He bandaged the wounds. He took care of. He had mercy upon this individual. Christians had a charity that was profoundly different from that of the Greco-Romans. The early Christians practiced caritas as opposed to liberalitas of the Romans. Caritas is giving to receive the recipients, economic, to relieve the recipients economic or physical distress without expecting something in return. That's what the Christian did. Well, as those who practice liberalitas meant giving something with the expectation of having or being given a favor or something in return from the person who received the gift. So the Christian idea of charity differed in regards to motive than the Romans. Roman pagan religions provided no motive for charity. In the pagan religious practices, people were minor spectators at the religious services where the Christians, on the other hand, in their services, there was an active participation by everyone. They heard and they shared things with each other. And they understood together God's redemptive act of love in Jesus Christ. And that motivated them to help each other in their ecclesia in a time of need. Christian charity was completely voluntary. According to Roman culture, such behavior justified common sense. It was a sign of weakness. It was viewed as a waste of energy. There was nothing to be gained by helping somebody else. And it wouldn't help the Roman Empire and the Roman state. So compassion, brothers and sisters, is a biblical innovation. In ancient cultures, compassion was pretty rare. It was rare to care for the sick rare to help the poor. The law of Moses, we know, provided for the poor. It provided for those in need, kept them from starving. It was set up that way. But in the Greco-Roman world, it wasn't the case. They did use a public system to provide food in Rome to keep riots from happening. And occasionally they did help the poor, or some great wealthy patrician would, 
would, uh, would dish out bread to the city. But there was nothing like the things we have today, like fundraisers, where people solicit money that, that is in turn to do good works or give it to the poor. In Judaism, the poor received alms as individuals on the street, begging, or they were taken care of by their family. But money was not collected by any organization to then be redistributed. In the New Testament, we see the Jerusalem poor fund. Money for relief of a famine. Agabus predicts this severe famine that's coming upon the whole world. And the disciples decide to send relief to their brothers and sisters in Judea and in Jerusalem. And in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 through 4, Paul gives instructions in how they should do this. He tells them when they come together, they should set aside some of their income, have a collection, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? And then that money would be sent off to those who are in need in Jerusalem the next time that Paul goes there. This concept of the poor fund, this collection was really a unique innovation. It's unprecedented in the ecclesial world and unheard of in the Roman world. It was a special way to share the gracious gift that these members had in order to meet a very serious need of brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. 1 John 4 and 11, Dear friends, if God so loved us, then we also ought to love another. It was applying that principle every day in life. And again, we harken back to Philippians 2, verses 4 and 5, that we should be concerned about the interest of others. And that we should have the same attitude toward one another as Jesus Christ had for us. Look to the interests of others and extending charity to the poor, to the sick and the dying was now a Christian norm and not a pagan practice. Paul writes to the Galatians while they're raising this relief fund and those same ecclesias while they're raising money to help those in Judea are also experiencing the same famine that those in Judea are. There's an inscription in Asia Minor dated to this period that records the horror of the devastating effects of this famine on those people who were living in Asia Minor, in other words, the Galatians. A famine in the land, flesh eating, that's how people are surviving by cannibalism. Terrible and bearing inescapable death that gripped the whole Roman world. It's the same famine, but they are bringing money from their own pockets to help those in need. Paul encourages his readers in Galatia to use their money, to use their resources to help people, not only in Judea now, but because the famine is widespread in Asia Minor, to help people everywhere. So we must not grow weary in doing good. For in due time, we will reap if we do not give up. So then, whenever you have an opportunity, let's do good to all people. Let's do good to all people, and especially to those who belong to the family of faith. And that's what the Christians did. The Christians helped and gave to everyone in need. A late first century document, the Didache urged, Give to everyone who asks thee, and do not refuse. And similarly, the shepherd of Hermes, an early 2nd century epistle, enjoins all Christians to give simply to all without asking, without asking doubtfully to whom thou givest, but give to all. Julian the Apostate, who was the last pagan emperor of Rome, clearly understood the power of what the Christians were doing. He wrote the following, these impious Galileans, and that's his term for Christians, not only feed their own, but ours also, welcoming them with their agape. They attract them as children are attracted to cakes 
whilst the pagan priests, they neglect the poor, the hated Galileans devote themselves to works of charity and by a display of false compassion have established and given effect to their pernicious errors. Such practice is common among them and causes great contempt for our gods. So a corollary to showing compassion to those in need and providing for them is the way that orphan and widows were treated in the New Testament. Did you know that in the Old Testament, widows are discussed 81 times? And usually it's in connection to God's care for widows and his anger for those who harm widows. There are a number of named widows in Scripture, at least 12, but you can think of uh, some of them, Ruth and Naomi, uh, Oprah, Anna, Tamar, maybe Mary. This kind of attention, I think, shows that God was profoundly concerned for the widows, along with strangers and those who were fatherless. In fact, the Scriptures say that he is the defender of widows. Psalm 68 and verse 5. He is a father to the fatherless and an advocate for widows. He cares for the weak. He cares for the vulnerable. And he makes this point very clear in the Old Testament by hammering it home again and again and again. And the prophets don't miss it either. They condemn those who wrong widows. Isaiah chapter 10 Verses 1 through 3. Beware of those who enact unjust policies so they can steal what widows own. It was a warning to this misbehavior and stealing from widows. And Jeremiah echoes the same language where in Jeremiah 22 he says that they should not exploit or mistreat resident foreigners who live in the land, children who have no fathers, and widows. Don't exploit and mistreat the widows. And Ezekiel does the same thing. Learn to do what's right. Promote justice. Give the oppressed reason to celebrate. Take up the cause of the orphan. Defend the rights of the widow. That's our Ezekiel verse. Now, that's the example in the Old Testament. You think Jesus ignores that example? He doesn't. He continues that special care and concern for widows. Luke chapter 7, verses 12 to 14. The widow of name, where Jesus raises her son. It's a short couple of verses, but do you know that the only thing that's given as to the reason why Jesus raised the son of this widow is his compassion for her as a widow. She's now socially alone. With her son gone, she has no protection in the first century Jewish culture. And Jesus has compassion on her and says, do not weep. And he proceeds to raise her from the dead. Mark chapter 2, verses 38 to 40, we see Jesus condemning those who would devour widows' property or their households. And he's talking about the religious leaders of that day who were supposed to practice the law that they knew of in the Old Testament. And rather than protect the widows, they would rather devour their property and destroying them on a pretense and taking financial advantage of them. Now, since God defends widows, and since Jesus defends and comforts the widows, and be no, it's no surprise that the first century ecclesia emulates that example. Paul gives specific instruction about different groups, and one of those groups are the widows. Honor widows, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 3, who are truly in need. And that Greek word that's translated honor carries a double meaning. It 
involves financial support and respect. And it can carry both meanings at the same time. So we are to honor widows with financial support and respect, just as Paul commanded. Acts chapter 6, we have a whole section discussing the care of widows in the Ecclesia. The apostles thought that this issue was so important and it was so, to, so imperative that they made special arrangements. They set up a committee or a group that would take care of this problem regarding widows. And do you notice the language that's used to describe these seven brothers who are going to oversee this program? It wasn't it wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't uh, something that was done carelessly. These brothers were well attested, of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom. You, you think they'd be put to other use that might be more important, but that's not how God saw it. These seven men were put to the use of administer, administrating a program for the widows in the first century of Asia. And you know what else is unusual about this? It lists them by name. <coughs> very, very unusual. And the outcome of this decision and the care for widows, at least in part, there were other factors, is that the word of God continued to spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly. Then finally, James mentions the care of widows and compares that care to what he calls pure and undefiled religion before God. There is an outside source that speaks about this. It's the Epistle of Barnabas, and we're not going to read that, but this epistle describes what the pagans did. They ignore the widow and the orphan. orphan. They are murderers of children who turn away from someone who is in need. They are utterly sinful. So the things that we talked about in relation to widows also applies to orphans. It's kind of an extension or a corollary. They're often grouped together, widows and orphans. Sometimes it's foreigners, widows, and orphans. But the idea is that those who are unprivileged, those who are destitute, those who are poor and in need are to be taken care of. The Ecclesia, according to Justin Martyr, informs us that collections were taken during church services to help the orphans. That was common. Tertullian tells us that an ecclesia in Carthage, North Africa, had a common treasury to aid boys and girls who were orphans. And this behavior was noticed by the Romans. It was spoken about in the empire. In the empire. An example is Emperor Julian, who was to lament that the Christians whom he detested showed love and compassion, whereas his pagan countrymen did not. So people who think our modern idea of compassion and charity is like a, a Western concept that just you know, developed on its own, a result of the upward uh, movement of civilization in general, they're wrong. And charity because of the influence of Christianity, of these things that we've been talking about in the lives of our first century brothers and sisters. Modern charity, modern compassion comes from this moral imperative of our first century peers. First demanded by God, then demonstrated by Jesus and applied in their lives. So just to conclude today's thoughts and and a few thoughts regarding this past week. The Emperor Julian clearly saw the writing on the wall. The Roman Empire would not succumb to political upheaval or force, but to love, the love of Christ. Julian's dying words in AD 563 were, Vasisti Galilee. You Galileans, in other words, you Christians, have conquered. The message of the early gospel years had a greater personal effect on the believers then than I think it does 
today. Even though the Roman Empire was prosperous, many believers coming from a lower class on the wrong social strata or were outcasts of society gained a new faith that made them brothers and sisters with each other and with Jesus Christ. And it was in this ecclesia that these believers found refuge and a belief that the pagans didn't have and that the Roman system couldn't provide. The gospel changed the way these believers lived their lives in the face of horrible persecution. I mentioned a little digression. It refers to the word metamorphos. That's talking about in Greek an external change. But you know what the Apostle Paul does? He changes it. You can't find in any literature in the Greek language where metamorphosis is talking about something you can't see outwardly. It's always about a transformation externally. But Paul changes it and says, do not be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that you may test and approve what is the will of God. And in First, in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 18, and we all, with unveiled faces, reflecting the Lord, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image. That's a process. It's something that is going on right now. Jesus asked of his disciples that there be a metamorphosis, an internal change manifested in the way that we treat each other. There were no campaigns to eliminate slavery, no agitation to reform the religious system, no proposals for equal rights for women, no demands on the government to provide for those who were poor and oppressed, no public campaigns about the horrors of abandonment, no concept of the elimination of slavery and social classes in society, no request to reform the world that the Romans lived in. But a change did happen. A change happened in how they lived and how they behaved and how they treated one another. And that's what affected the Roman world. The gospel turned the world upside down by living what they believed. Those teachings changed everything. 